Well, hello and welcome back to the Andrew Eborn Show and a glimpse of my very special guest. We're going to go all the way over to New York to see an icon of the business, fantastically <laughs> talented, Dean Friedman. How are you doing, Dean? I'm very well, Andrew. How are you doing yourself? I am doing incredible. And you're looking so gloriously colourful. <laughs> well, um, it's uh, it's how I wake up in the morning. If I'm too uh, bleary-eyed to, to see the, the horizon, uh, then uh, I know if, if I... <laughs> If I have to look at some color, it, uh, it, uh, it excites all those, uh, um, uh, what do you call them, cones in your eyes and wakes oh, yeah. up a little bit. <laughs> I think if the world wasn't awake, they're certainly awake now, which is glorious. And tell me what, tell me about where you are at the moment in New York. Is that your normal studio place? Because you've got your, your rhinoceros on the wall, you've got your, your keyboards and everything. Talk to me about where you are. Well, I'm based uh, in Peekskill, New York. It's about an hour north of New York City. Uh, and uh, I'm right here in my home studio, uh, right downstairs in, in the basement of our house. Uh, it's the, called the Honking Goose Studios because previous incarnations were uh, in the flight path of uh, Canadian geese who used to make a, a lot of noise. In fact, if you listen to songs for grown-ups, uh, you'll hear some of those geese somewhere on one of those tracks in the background. Uh, making a lot of noise. So this is uh, where I record and also where uh, I host a, a monthly webcast. And uh, it's very convenient just to, instead of driving, you know, flying 3,000 miles and then driving all over the UK, uh, I just get to uh, stumble down the steps and fire up the PC and, uh, and I get to play for uh, always an enthusiastic audience. It's fantastic. And that's what I love about this sort of forum, if you like, is that it introduces it's a very different thing because you had a 40 city tour already planned already scheduled in the diary about to happen and everything came crashing down didn't it uh yep uh, uh, it brought the world to a standstill and uh you know especially for touring musicians or uh, anyone that makes their living on the road uh it, it really uh was uh uh, a, a traumatic uh, scheduling event. So uh, I found myself over the course of just a few days rescheduling an entire 40 city tour. And in fact, in some instances, I've had to reschedule venues three times over the course of the last 16 months. But I am determined, Andrew, that come April 2022, which is when my next live uh, gig uh, across the pond is scheduled, Unless some giant meteor goes crashing into the moon uh, and uh, blows it up so that it, it, uh, it makes air travel uh, impossible, I, I do intend to uh, fulfill these dates uh, in the spring of 2022. Oh, and uh, uh, the dates are already on my website. I was going to say, I was right in there. I'm fantastic, really looking forward to that schedule. So those are all planned, those 40 dates. Um, but as you say, you've been doing things in your living room and there's a strange intimacy about seeing into people's homes and you you see the recordings you and the right dots on the wall and the, the wonderful <laughs> stuff there's a glorious intimacy about doing it day, isn't there? you know i had the same skepticism that i think most people do about the, the sort of the the distant nature of a, a, a zoom uh, performance conversation and, and yet uh, over the the months that I've been doing it, I've really grown to appreciate what what you just described, that, that very strange, weird intimacy about it. Because if you think about it, when I'm doing a live gig, I can see the usually the people in the first couple of rows. I can see their faces and I can see their expressions and how they react to what I'm doing. And that's always really satisfying. But I, I can't see anyone in the back of the room. And uh, uh, by comparison, in the Zoom concert, uh, I can flip through the gallery pages and I can see everybody up close and uh, right into their homes, right into their living rooms and bedrooms and kitchens. And, and I can see, you know, pets jumping up on their laps and their families wandering in and out of the frame. And, and, and that, what they're snacking you, that, on. Those have been my favorite moments. I mean, it, it, same sort of thing here. I normally do like this in a big studio and things like that. But there's a sort of intimacy and it's that shared experience doing it over these video platforms in a way you don't normally get it because you can populate. And I, I've heard you talk about this. You can populate your screen with your audience. You can interact in a way that is just not possible with 
a, a, a normal concert, as you say. You see the front few, few rows if you're lucky. But on this one, everybody's like a little box on there. They all take a, a special <laughs> part in the experience. Well, not only that, but if you think about it, in, in a regular live gig, and believe me, I, I cherish live gigs. I, you know, that's part of my uh, mission on Earth is to share songs with the live audience. But uh, in lieu of that, there, this, there are some curious aspects of, of a Zoom concert. And for one example is, if you're in a live concert uh, sitting in the audience, you can see me on stage, and then you can see the backs of everybody's heads in front of you. And that's it. But in the Zoom concert, curiously, you can see everybody else in the audience, uh, you know, up close and personal, and you can chat with them in real time during the performance without interrupting them. <laughs> so it, ha it does foster this really uh, unique and un unusual community, sense of community uh, that uh, I've grown to value and appreciate. And I, and I think that's right. It's a new opportunity. But people, I mean, you've been, you do it brilliantly because you, say you do your requests and you interact with the audience in a way a lot of people don't. A lot of people are still pretty lousy out doing these Zoom shows because everybody but everybody's become a broadcaster. Well, as you know, it's, it's no easy task. It's a challenge and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's something I'm still trying to wrap my head around in, in terms of the technology, especially... Uh, you know, I'll generally have someone helping me out uh, with tech uh, and sort of just manning the Zoom door. But uh, even so, to to communicate with the audience and to, to remember the lyrics to my songs and uh, just sort of orient myself during the middle of the show while I'm navigating all the technology. Oh, yes. I know you've got to do this funny thing. You, your eyes go over here while you're trying to navigate on, the, on that sort of stuff. It is a bit bizarre. So what would be your top tips for a successful Zoom concert? Just keep doing it. <laughs> Just try to relax uh, and uh, keep doing it. And eventually, some of it will become innate and you'll be familiar with the weird idiosyncrasies of, of the medium. And ultimately, it's... At some point, it's no different than getting up on stage and engaging that audience and sort of inviting them into the music. And what, what I love as well uh, about it is that wonderful sort of intimacy as well. But you've managed to get the great stadium sound. There's that wonderful echo as well. <laughs> oh, well, that's just the uh, by virtue of my little mixer here <laughs> uh, to give a little ambiance. Uh, and and also to to provide some headroom for those high notes. Okay. It's always very, very good. I'm going to take you back. We've got a little bit of time today. And what, what I love and what I do with all my interviews is basically immerse yourself in the wonderful, wonderful world that, uh, that is Dean Friedman. I've looked at virtually everything you've done. I've listened to virtually every one of those wonderful albums. Um, but also you get a real insight into the man and the humor and the glorious ways that you paint pictures, if you like, of people's lives. And that's what they can relate to it, isn't it? Well, you know, growing up, uh, I had all kinds of musical influences. My mom was a, a singer, and she performed on Broadway and in film. And there was always some Broadway show tune on the piano. There was always music in the house. So inevitably, music was going to be a part of it. But as soon as I got a transistor radio, I started listening to everything, all the top 40 and, and, and beyond. And uh, anyone that listens to my albums knows that uh, they're eclectic and uh, you'll hear country, folk, jazz, pop, rock, uh, really uh, you name it across the board. And so I've embraced all those musical influences, but I've always had a special affinity for those singer-songwriters, folks like Joni Mitchell and Randy Newman, Paul Simon, who managed to, as you say, paint pictures with their words and music to... Uh, you know, create a scene on, on, almost of a cinematic uh, quality uh, to be able to transport the listener. And starting out as a, a singer-songwriter, as an aspiring young singer-songwriter, th that was something I always hoped to do. And still to this day, when I'm sitting down to write a song, that's my challenge, is to, to create a, a, a little world for the audience to step into briefly and uh, to become to invite them to become part of the song yeah, absolutely. And, uh, well, it is that engagement isn't it they're effectively short stories set to music well i think of myself as a someone who writes short stories set to music and uh, 
that, that is the particular goal. And I've always felt that by, I, I tend to populate my songs with a lot of granular detail. And I think that helps root the listener into some shared reality. And then they get to fill in all the blanks with their own memories and their own uh, context. And, uh, and in that way, I hope they become part of the song. Absolutely. Born on the 23rd of May, 1955 in Paris, uh, <laughs> New Jersey. Uh, what do you remember about those glorious days in the bosom of suburbia? Well, uh, as I say, I remember growing up in a house filled with music, so inevitably it was going to be something uh, that was a part of my life. Uh, and then in my you know, early teens doing coffee houses and then someone would throw me 15 bucks for a gig, I thought, wow, this is brilliant, doing something I love to do and getting paid for it. Uh, I'm still working on the getting paid for it part, but uh, I got my first guitar at nine and learned three chords, started singing Beatles songs and, uh, you know, the monkeys and uh, eventually writing my own songs. And uh, I never stopped. And, and what's great about it, your first guitar was bought at Manny's Music, wasn't it, with a bag of quarters you played with that? <laughs> That's true, Andrew. And uh, I earned the bag of quarters uh, riding my bicycle delivering newspapers. I delivered the Bergen Evening Record all over Paramus, New Jersey. And uh, I dumped that back of quarters on the counter at Manny's, and I said, I'd like that guitar. And uh, that uh, started me off. And, and it's a glorious way of doing it. And I tell you what, it's rather, I, I say this to, to my children as well, is that uh, it's the thing you save up for that you cherish the most. If somebody had just given you a guitar, you probably wouldn't value it as much. But the fact that you saved your money from your paper round and bought it, it made it a bit more special, didn't it? I suppose so. Yeah. <laughs> I was less inclined to bang it around uh, and leave it outside in the rain. Yeah. And uh, um, so, yeah, they're the tools of the trade. And, you know, there's also some kind of affection that you have for, for a guitar. And I, I, I've always found it a little curious that, you know, guitars tend to be shaped like an hourglass, like a, a, a woman. So for a guy guitarist, I, I, I wonder whether that's a part of it. I know. The, the painter Pablo Picasso makes ample use of uh, metaphor uh, with his uh, paintings about guitars. Uh, I think it's no coincidence. I oh, know you're, you're absolutely right. Now, the connection seems to be a bit, but we lost you briefly there, but I think the hamsters are churning around very quickly in the wheels, so you're back with us, which is, uh, which is great. Do you still have that first guitar from Manny's Guitars? You know, I'm embarrassed to say I don't, and uh, it probably wound up in, in our attic and uh, in many moves, it seems to have disappeared. Uh, but uh, I've still somewhere. got plenty banging around. Well, <laughs> that must be the case. And you started writing songs at a, a very tender age, I think about 11 once when you wrote your first song. Actually, even earlier than that, I was nine. I, I, uh, I wrote a song called I'd Love to Take a Swim with You in the Summertime. Uh, it went, I'd love to take a swim with you in summertime. Oh, yeah. It swims so far in the ocean so blue in the summertime. Oh, yeah. And it went on like that. Um, of course, I, I sang it even an octave or two higher than I can sing it today. And uh, the strange thing is I, I played it for my fourth grade teacher who I, was, I had a mad crush on. She played it for her brother who was a lawyer in the music industry. He played it for a publisher. And they actually offered me a publishing contract at the tender age of nine. And uh, we scheduled a, a meeting uh, to sign the contract. I rehearsed my signature for a week, and uh, we had this signing ceremony over milk and cookies. And I, I signed my first uh, publishing contract at nine. And promptly thereafter, about a month later, the company went bankrupt, which oh, no. probably foreshadowed everything that's happened in my career since. So 1964, that would have been then. Um, and you, you had a lot like, when, you, when you were nine. And you have a look at that sort of side. Do you remember what the deal was? You, you had a lawyer involved. They must make sure. No, not a clue. All I know is that, I, like I say, practiced my signature and I signed Dean Friedman at the bottom. And, uh, and then we uh, had milk and cookies. And, uh... The rock star life, you know, milk and cookies ever since. Exactly. So you then started playing at uh, uh, basically weddings and bar mitzvahs and so on and so forth. What sort of music were you playing then? Well, you know what? The great thing about uh, 
playing in a, in a cover band is that you really get to explore and experiment and learn all kinds of music from all these great singer-songwriters. And, you know, when I'm doing a Dean Friedman concert, uh, you know, as eclectic as my music is, uh, the audience still expects to hear Dean Friedman. Uh, whereas if I'm performing in a, uh, a cover band, I can be anybody. I, you know, I can be Stevie Wonder one minute and, uh, uh, you know, Dolly Parton the next. <laughs> and so it, 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 it's an opportunity to explore your voice and to, and to, to learn music from the inside out and a whole slew of idioms and I, I, I always enjoyed it but I, I always forgot to bring my shoes because whenever we play a wedding band we're supposed to wear a tux and you know nice uh, dress shoes but I always forgot to change my shoes I, was, I would always sh wind up showing up to the gig in white sneakers and then I would have to hide behind the amp. We should do what some artists who just stone famously and uh... I think a, a number of artists were before her, James Hunt in the Formula One world, is don't wear anything on your feet. Uh, that might have worked. <laughs> uh, ahead of your time. So you, you have the wonderful band called Marsha and the Self-Portraits. Is that what it's called? Uh, yeah, I was a sideman in the band. And as I say, it, it was great fun. We played weddings and bar mitzvahs and lounge gigs and uh, the occasional... Uh, volunteer Ambulance Corps uh, uh, show. Uh, and it, as I say, it was, it, was, it was fun and a great learning experience for any musician. Yeah, I think it really is that, that sort of learning the ropes of it. Do it the hard way. Go out and perform in front of a live audience. Because it teaches you a number of things. Reacting with a real audience, you know what they want and, uh, and how to give it to them. It's true. Uh, you, you do get a sense of that interaction and, you know, what excites uh, the, the audience. In particular, what it, it engages an audience that's not really paying attention to what you're doing. And so that's a, a useful skill uh, as you get out, uh, go out into the, the world and find yourself on stage. Uh, City of College, uh, New York, beckoned. Um, tell, and rather famous teachers. Talk to me about those. Well, I, 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 I was getting frustrated in high school, and uh, my mom uh, somehow managed me to get me accepted into an early admissions program at CCNY, which is a city university in New York City. And I uh, wound up skipping the last few years of high school and went straight into college when I was 15 years old. And was fortunate to be able to study with uh, a lot of really brilliant uh, musicians, uh, you know, some legendary jazz folks like John Lewis from Modern Jazz Quartet and great guitarist Barry Galbraith and uh, just a, 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 a faculty of just consummate musicians who really gave me a, a strong grounding uh, in my theory and harmony and, uh, you know, not that I was a particularly uh, disciplined student, but to their surprise and in spite of what seemed my uh, distracting attention, I, I really absorbed a lot, learned a lot from them, and it served me really well as I uh, you know, started writing my own songs and, and, and getting out there professionally. Yeah, you say you were distracted. What sort of things distracted you? Girls. <laughs> But uh, you know, also, that's a, a main motivation for any male musician getting into the music business. That just goes without saying. But well, the inspiration for so many songs, including uh, that brilliant hit, which will come on to that aerial, um, which, uh, as you say, is a composite of all those sort of gross experiences. Um, but just before we go on to that, one of your teachers was David Bromberg, um, who uh, co-wrote with uh, George Harrison and played with some of the greats as well. What do you remember of him? Well, uh, I was a big David Bromberg fan. Uh, he's considered by uh, folks here in the States as the godfather of Americana. Uh, he uh, is a great guitarist and a songwriter as well. As you say, he, he co-wrote uh, uh, with George Hold Harrison and a whole bunch of folks. He, he played on and produced uh, uh, classic albums by Phoebe Snow, and uh, as I say, he's a great songwriter himself. He, he did a guest lecture at City College in one of my classes. Um, and I 
you know, nudged him uh, until he finally broke down and listened to some of my songs. And uh, eventually he said, well, you know what, I'm gonna uh, share this with some folks. And he introduced me to the folks who became my first managers. They were the owners of a, a famous nightclub in New York City called The Bottom Line, which at the time was the premier showcase uh, for uh, new artists uh, breaking out in the United States in, 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 in the Northeast in New York City. And they signed me to be my managers. They, they took me, uh, the first label they took me to, uh, Life Song Records, they signed me to a label uh, deal. And the first single off the first album out of the box became a top 20 hit, that was Ariel. Uh, it, but back to David Bromberg, uh, I, he was very gracious in sort of hearing me out and, and recognizing what I was doing and very generously sharing uh, his industry knowledge and connections to, to allow me entree in, into this weird business that I am still in. <laughs> and it, it is great. You, you do find some wonderful people in, in the profession who are very giving of their time, not just inspirational, but they give you some real lessons as to how to survive in what's quite a tricky business. What sort of lessons did, did he give you? Well, not just musical lessons, uh, but the way he conducted himself in, in the industry, the way he lived his life, uh, and even the degree to which at some point he stepped back from the music business and uh, spent years uh, studying how to build violins. And, and that's something that surprised a lot of his fans, but really struck me uh, with what it suggested as far as how, how you establish priorities. Even if you're in the midst, in the throes of uh, industry, career, and you know, all the exciting things that, that, that are entailed, uh, that sometimes there are other priorities in life that you need to give your attention to. And uh, the fact that he withdrew in that way uh, it was an important lesson for me as well. Uh, and particularly when I was dropped from uh, my label after McDonald's Girl was banned, it gave me a sense of, uh, of calm and understanding that uh, this was not the only thing in the world that I could dedicate my life to, that there were other pursuits that were uh, valid and exciting and fulfilling, and uh, that I never had to stop being a musician. I didn't have to stop writing songs just because some industry executive uh, decided I was not in their minds worthy. And that mindset, that attitude, uh, is something that I, I guess I got in part from Dave Bromberg, and uh, it's served me well. Yeah, I, I think resilience in this business is absolutely right. You need to have that realize it's not everything. Because especially in the current climate where people have had to effectively reinvent themselves, if you didn't have that resilience and those sort of life lessons, many people have fallen the wayside, haven't they? Absolutely. And uh, I, I think it's a, a lesson uh, well learned early on in your career because uh, the industry itself, it's an industry that uh, eats its young. <laughs> Unless you're aware of that dynamic, uh, it, it's hard to defend and protect yourself from it. But if you have some sense of what else is going on as you're you know, simply minding your own business, trying to be creative and writing songs and communicating with an audience, if you have some sense of the greater context in, in which that occurs, you can uh, attempt to navigate it, uh, to be able to come out uh, uh, less damaged on the other side. <laughs> no, that's all good. Uh, so Catman and West, uh, and as you say, the, the, the Life Song label, um, almost straight away, this is almost unheard of with, with, with many artists, you, you sort of at a, a very tender age, suddenly had this massive hit on, on your hands. How did that come about? Well, I, uh, I, I, Ariel was the last track written uh, and recorded on that first album. And uh, intuitively, I understood that, that it had a lot of uh, potential commercially. Uh, but when it did uh, come out and was released, uh, there was a, a station in New York called WNEW-FM. It was the largest FM station in the United States and the most influential. 
And I was called into the record label uh, one day and they, they, they chastised me. They said, Dean, you have to tell your friends to stop calling WNEWFM on the request lines. They're getting really annoyed with all the calls they're getting from your friends. And I said, I don't think that's my friends. And it took them a few more days to appreciate that it, w it became a instant sensation, word of mouth phenomena. Uh, immediately upon hearing the song on the radio, people would call up and ask to have it played again. And, uh, but again, they, at first they accused me of en enlisting my army of friends, uh, which uh, tickled me no end. And uh, it just proved that the song deserved to be heard and uh, insisted on being heard. Yeah, absolutely. And we we'll come on to um, the, the story behind the song. But um, I know one of the, the greatest indulgences that I have, I get to have my opportunity to have a bit of live music. And uh, you, you very kindly offered to play something like, why don't we start with Ariel? Well, I shall give it my best shot, considering the, the time of day. It's got some of those high notes. And, and I'll see uh, how best I can uh, hit them. I'll give it, I'll, 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 I'll give it a shot. Dude, this is my glorious 
indulgent that I'm doing. <laughs> but this, you're singing in my living room, as I say, normally in the studio and things like that. Um, but what, what I love about that song is not just how catchy it is, but the glorious lyrics. There can be no finer lyrics than, hi, yeah, I guess I am. Uh, it was a phrase that uh, was oft repeated at shopping malls all over, across America that summer of 1977 when it came out. Yeah, extraordinary stuff. And I, I know you've been asked many, many times whether there was an actual aerial, and I think uh, your, your normal answer is, well, it's a composite. Lots of different people relate to it because they're different girls and it, it sort of made sense. Is that right? It's true. Uh, you know, I, it, it was... Uh, written about, I guess, this sort of I idealized young woman uh, based on all these girls I had a crush on growing up uh, in suburbia. Uh, although a few years later, not too long after that, um, uh, I, I did meet someone uh, in Riverside Park. Uh, her name was Allison, not Ariel, but she uh, shared a lot of those attributes. Uh, Ariel's described as sort of a pot-smoking Jewish girl in a peasant blouse, uh, although she, she, she's not vegetarian. She, she shared a lot of those other characteristics, and I wound up marrying her, and uh, we've been married 40-plus uh, years uh, uh, by now. And uh, so, uh, yeah, in a way, uh, there was an Ariel. There is an Ariel. Well, I, that, that's lovely. I always love it when the stories end with a sort of happy, you found your Ariel. It was Alison. You were walking dogs, weren't you, in the park? That's right, exactly. Now, there is one risk to being a prophetic songwriter. Uh, You've got to be careful what you write because a lot of it comes true. So, for example, on my third album, Rumpled Romeo, I wrote a song called Marginally Middle Class, which uh, expressed the idea that I didn't need to be rich. I just want to be just making it okay enough to, you know, to, to you know, be able to, uh, you know, join, you know, have a barbecue in the backyard and, uh, and uh, have a dog named Mike and... And so anyway, unfortunately, uh, some of that marginal middle class pro prophecy came true. So I'm a little wary when I write lyrics these days oh, no, that no, are, no, you know, no, forecasting no, my future. I, I love, I love uh, the, the lyrics. And I tell you what we should do is whenever you're tempted, whenever you're tempted to talk about this glorious song, I would just make you say, oh, play that one for me, play that one for me. You pick as we go through. Because it's one of the things that you do for your fans and these wonderful uh, things that you do over the internet, Zoom and other platforms are available, um, is you do a sort of request thing. But I'd, I'd like to flip that, because I quite like the idea of introducing people to some of your rich catalogs, some of the things that they may not normally expect you to do. Because um, a lot of times, when people like to label people, don't they? And very unfairly, after nine studio albums, nine studio albums, some people, people say you're a one-hit wonder. But you're much more than that, aren't you? Well, uh, you know, I've had uh, various different hits in different territories all around the world. So if, if someone wants to, uh, to characterize me as a one-hit wonder, they would have to qualify that by saying it's a multi-one-hit, yes. uh, multi-wonder. Uh, but uh, frankly, the term, I, I, I think the people that use it are, are not fully aware of how disparaging it really is because it suggests that whoever is uh, named that one-hit wonder never had the goods to come up with a, a decent follow-up hit, that that was the only creative effort of theirs that was worthy of airplay. And the reality is that that's never the case, is that more often than not, in fact, all the time, uh, the reason an artist only has one hit is generally to do with uh, an abusive uh, record label, publisher, and manager. And uh, because it's an industry that eats its young. And uh, I, I think labels and, uh, you know, DJs and presenters should be forced to add that disclaimer, is that uh, this is, you know, uh, a one-hit wonder, but it's our fault. We're responsible for the abuse that we uh, f perpetuated uh, to the young, young artists in the industry. That's just my personal gripe, but uh, I think there's a lot of truth to it. Oh, no, in any I, case, that, it never stopped me from making music. Oh, no, no, I, I, I think, and it's right. And what I like to do on this show is to make sure we air those sort of views because uh, people don't understand. And it's, it's unfair and it's uh, demoralizing and, and so on and so forth. To turn and dismiss them as one hit wonder. You have a glorious catalog of work. But it's also right, Dean, isn't it, to shine a spotlight on an industry and the pressure 
that is put on artists once you have a success with your first thing, last track on the album, you had a tremendous success, number 24 in the Billboard 100 and so on and so forth. Once you've had that success, the pressure is on for the next one, isn't it? It is, and uh, it's a challenge, and uh, it, it uh, takes a lot of work, effort, and uh, also good luck in general to, uh, to be able to uh, overcome that. Uh, you know, there's always referred to as the sophomore slump when the second album comes out, because you have all your life to prepare all the songs for the first album. Uh, and then in, in the frenzy of promotion, uh, you're expected to you know, be as creative and as productive as you were over the last decade uh, in, a, in a period of just a few months. Now, I was fortunate in that I was uh, working with a, a bunch of really talented musicians and uh, writing a, 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 a lot of songs I was, I was real proud of. Uh, but uh, there again, my record label called me in to chastise me uh, when I delivered the second album, Webble Said the Rocking Chair. Uh, they yelled at me for a, a good half hour saying, oh, you made a terrible record. You should have done a nice solo acoustic album like your first album. And, um, you know, uh, you're not listening to anybody. You're a spoiled artist, and uh, you're just, you know, it's a bad record, and uh, we're really disappointed in you. Uh, that was the second album, Well, I said the Rocket Chair. Now, I sat there listening to these, you know, industry executives uh, chastising me and berating me for what I knew to be a really quality effort. And uh, it only confirmed for me that they didn't have a clue. And was especially satisfying when a week later we got a telex, which tells you what era this is. It was before even faxes and uh, e let alone email. We got a telex saying that uh, uh, Lucky Stars had entered the charts and was racing up uh, the charts. And uh, they were just dumbfounded, scratching their heads. They couldn't understand why this terrible record I made uh, was, by, was being so well received and embraced across the pond. Uh, and it comes down to business and politics. It's just the nature of the beast. And I was fortunate that the indie label across the pond, uh, GTO, had some sense of ha how to uh, introduce the record. And it, as soon as it got airplay, it was embraced. Yeah. And, and, and what so, uh, a brilliant song. And one, one of my favorite Lucky Stars. I mean, lots of people sort of talk about that as well because everybody can relate to it, can't they? It's where, uh, it's that sort of situation where like you're with your wife or whatever, and you meet an ex effectively, and that's that awkward moment about how you feel and whether you really went for lunch with them and that sort of conversation, the inevitable row uh, that happened. Was there a moment, then, Dean, that sparked that song in your own mind? Well, not a moment so much as uh, a, a period of time where I was driving a taxi in New York City. Uh, and listening to a lot of country music on the radio. Now, at that time, in the late 70s, there were not a lot of pop duets. Uh, but uh, there has always been a long tradition of duets in country music. And they're always filled with marital strife and infidelity and squabbles and, and jealousy. And, and uh, so, in, in some ways, Lucky Stars was sort of my pop version of a traditional country music duet. And, uh, and certainly it, 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 its topic, its subject matter, and the things that it relays are familiar to any couple. Uh, that, uh, you know, that, that sense of, of jealousy, even in the most in, innocent circumstances. It's something everyone's familiar with. It's what we said beforehand about engagement and being able to relate to the lyrics. Because Everybody but everybody can see who's been on the surf for a nanosecond can envisage that sort of situation, can't they? Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's why it struck such a chord. Uh, but as often happens, it, it, it got so much airplay and became so ubiquitous at the time that there was a backlash. And bearing in mind, this was the era of punk and, uh, and disco also. And, and so, uh, you know, I came out with Lucky Stars, which was an admittedly funny, tongue-in-cheek uh, record, uh, almost a mini-musical encapsulated in a pop song. And I think people took it 
uh, they, they didn't appreciate that it was tongue in cheek. Um, and uh, it, it, there was a backlash, but I, I would challenge folks to, uh, as you proposed, to if you examine the lyrics, it's actually saying a lot uh, in, in a few words of, a few lines of dialogue. Uh, even the chorus, which is that, you know, you can thank your lucky stars that you're not as smart as you'd like to think you are. What does that mean exactly? It's kind of confusing. Just saying it is a little puzzling, and yet I think people intuitively got what that message was, which is that uh, you can't always rely on, on your brain to make smart decisions. Sometimes you have to listen really closely to your heart. And, uh, and so that's a message that somehow got through. And uh, so uh, I, I, I still get <laughs> uh, teased about the song, but I got to tell you, I'm really proud of it. I've always loved the song. I, I think it's brilliant, and you shouldn't. I mean, dude, so what? You know, I, I, the lyrics are so wonderful and brilliant, and you work on the sort of basis that it relates. You can relate to it. Everybody's been there, and because they've been there, they can see that situation. Well, I'm not making you walk backwards and forwards to, to the thing, but it, it's the perfect way to. To, to, if, if we get, as we get some, some lucky stars, would you play it for us? I'll give it a shot. <laughs> okay, I'm making you work. This is your morning workout as a That's person right. into the gym. Uh, but it's all fantastic stuff. And as I say, I, I normally like, I'm making it even worse, Eugene, because you're going to have to sing both the male and the female role as well. Well, I could make you sing the girls' part. Uh, you tell me if you're up for that. <laughs> Oh 
I, I tell you what, if I could be that roaring crowd for you, it would, be, it would make an absolute sense. So, while, whilst you're over there, I won't get you going backwards and forwards, but I'll get you to play another okay. one. But Lisa, t- tell me, is, is Lisa a real person or is that a composite as well? <laughs> well, uh, you know, some of uh, the, the lyrics are drawn from real life. <laughs> but... Um, uh, it, it's more uh, expressing a familiar experience than any particular experience. So is there a Lisa? Uh, well, there might have been a Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> in, amongst, in amongst the aerials and other bits, there was a Lisa there somewhere. And, uh, well, I had to ask you then, Dean, was it yeah. just lunch? Uh, well, uh, that is the question, isn't it? And uh, I think it's worth pondering. <laughs> You should be a politician. I love it. It's really good. Really good. That sort of but you talked about, I mean, one of the things that, uh, as, as wrongly, as you say, the press get a lot of things wrong. Like what I love on the show is the ability to get things right. Eddie's Warehouse, you were um, uh, basically crazy Eddie. Some people said that you were responsible for the jingle for that, but that wasn't true, was it? Well, no, I didn't write the song, but uh, they uh, invited me to sing a new version of, of a really famous New York jingle about Crazy Eddie. Oh, when you think you're ready, come on down to Crazy Eddie. It's, it's a really fun, infectious uh, song, is, and it was on the radio incessantly uh, uh, during uh, a period of time uh, in the 80s. And uh, so, yeah, uh, they, they invited me in to sing it. And, and in fact, they wanted to premiere this new version at one of their uh, company meetings. Uh, they rented out uh, the Beacon Theater in New York, a beautiful theater. And it was filled with crazy Eddie employees, over a thousand folks sitting there. Uh, and they had me uh, first sing the Star Spangled Banner and then uh, sing the Crazy Eddie, the, the, the new version of the Crazy Eddie theme song. And I was accompanied on stage by dancing appliances. Crazy Eddie sold appliances, you know, radios, TVs, boom boxes. And uh, so uh, there is some YouTube video on stage of me singing the, the Crazy Eddie theme song, surrounded by uh, dancing appliances. And it was one of those surreal moments that you never forget. I know, glorious, but, but that's what we love is that sort of sense of humor and surrealism. I mean, and humor <laughs> plays a big part in your work, doesn't it? Well, I've always seen uh, humor as a, uh, a crucial uh, tool in navigating what's often uh, a, 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 a surreal world. And I think you need to have a, a sense of humor and some perspective especially when things are, are, are depressing and dire, uh, that uh, to avoid succumbing to that negativity, you, be able, you have to see uh, you know, some of the comedy in, in our uh, endeavors, uh, because uh, otherwise you really are doomed to be dismayed. Well, no, you either laugh or you cry, don't you? That's why they have this sort of two masks when they have tragedy and comedy. True, true enough. Uh, and the other thing which I, I find with a, a lot of our guests is that uh, um, everybody's basically the same sort of challenges, maybe same sort of insecurity, same sort of foibles, if you like. I mean, Shakespeare, who put it, if you tickle me, do I not laugh? If you prick me, do I not bleed? But the other way around. Uh, and you work on, on that sort of basis because we are basically the same thing, main sort of human foibles affect us all, don't they? Well, it's what we share in common, uh, and you know, songs, along with all forms of art and writing, uh, are some mode of connection uh, to to give folks who might feel isolated in a particular experience. Uh, it can be a way to remind them that uh, they're not as isolated as they might feel, that, that those are feelings and experiences that are shared by many others, and that those others, uh, most of them have survived those circumstances. So I think it uh, provides folks with a little solace and comfort and hope. Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. You mentioned McDonald's Girl uh, earlier on, and that was uh, banned by the BBC. What was the story behind that, song? 
Well, I had written uh, what I knew right off the bat to be a, a, an infectious, pure pop song. And uh, it was released off my third album, Rumpled Romeo, and uh, officially banned by the BBC, which ultimately derailed my career. And uh, it, it was frustrating <laughs> because I knew if people got a chance to hear it, uh, they would love it and, and embrace it. And indeed, even though uh, it was banned and even though I was kicked off my label, uh, not too long after that, a then unknown band out of Canada uh, with the unlikely name of Bare Naked Ladies did a cover version of it, which was uh, one of their first airplay hits uh, in Canada uh, and led to them getting signed. And uh, uh, not too long after that, uh, another band called The Blenders did a cover version of it, which became a number one hit in Norway. And, and then uh, YouTube came along and McDonald's Girl uh, was the little song that insisted on being heard because suddenly uh, there were hundreds of videos posted all over the world of people performing their own versions or lip syncing to uh, existing versions of McDonald's Girl. And it was such a, a, a fun, nice surprise to see people embracing that song. And, uh, and then about 30 years later, I finally got a phone call from the corporate headquarters of McDonald's saying, uh, Mr. Friedman, we'd like to license your song for a national TV and radio campaign. And uh, I thought a moment, I said, well, that's great. What took you so fucking long? But that's my plan for the future, is to write a great song and then wait 30 years uh, for it to be acknowledged by some conglomerate. Uh, and uh, I'm not quite sure that that's the ideal retirement plan, but uh, I, I do expect that to well, no, occur. I, I think it's great. You should do a song about Coke. You should do a song about uh, uh, Microsoft. You do a song about Amazon. Uh, and the money just keeps rolling in for you, don't it, Dean? Well, assuming all those companies are still around in 30 years. <laughs> but yes, uh, but it, it did prove to me that, uh, you know, th there are some songs that insist on being heard, and, and McDonald's Girl was one of those. Well, I'll tell you what, a world exclusive <laughs> here on the Andrew Ebon Show, uh, I might be able to persuade you, uh, because I think this deserves uh, an audience with the original creator, the song that the BBC band, uh, McDonald's Girl, over to you, Dean. Sure, Andy, just for you, here you go. <laughs> uh, and also, these days, I, I have to uh, make sure to introduce this by saying the song is meant to be sung by a 15-year-old boy, a teenage, a teenage boy who's just smitten with the girl behind the counter. She doesn't act real tough. 
smile of innocence are so tender and warm And in love with a McDonald's girl She's an angel in a polyester uniform She's an angel in a polyester uniform She's an angel in a polyester uniform We're going to do all your albums. They're going to be spoiled rotten here, dude. Absolutely brilliant. But that wasn't the first time. BBC banned that, and uh, several years later, it's now making you money. And I'm great, as you say, bare naked ladies, uh, and so on and so forth. And the McDonald's Corporation himself embracing it. But controversy sort of surrounded you as well about uh, the 2005 tour, where you were offering to distribute certain things for people who bought your album. Tell me about that. Uh, well, uh, let, let me come closer and ponder that okay, as come, I come approach. Yes, you, can, you can tell us all about it. Um, I, I, I'm suddenly making you work. You go backwards and forwards. You might be able to get you on the guitar well uh, as well later. That'd be nice and <laughs> more transportable for you. Fantastic. We'll see. 2005 uh, tour. Talk to me about that. Well, I uh, had just uh, completed uh, an album called Squirrels in the Attic. And uh, it was inspired by uh, my first uh, few uh, uh, attending the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, uh, which is filled with great theater and music. Uh, but in particular, there's always a strong focus on, on comedy and great comics who perform there. And it always really struck me. Uh, and uh, inspired me to go home and write a whole bunch of comedy songs. There's always been comedy on my albums, as you suggested earlier, but uh, that experience at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival uh, inspired me to just do one album dedicated to, uh, to, to, to comic material, and a, a lot of it was uh, uh, very adult comedy, so I had to put a, 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 an advisory warning label. Flavor on, on the label, absolutely. On, on the album. And one of the songs was uh, just a, a song that was espousing affection for and the relatively uh, benign quality of a certain herb. Uh, it's called Doint Doint, it's just a little joint. And it made a very simple point, which is that it's, it's uh, no more dangerous than alcohol. In fact, uh, the first verse, it, it goes, it's, it's 10 times safer than alcohol. And then it's 100 times safer than alcohol. And it makes a, a very true and inarguable point uh, that uh, this relatively benign herb, uh, which has been demonized and put uh, many millions of people in jail, uh, is uh, misunderstood uh, and uh, injustice ha has resulted uh, from that war on drugs. And, and I was expressing those thoughts in a very sort of lighthearted, uh, fun way. Uh, and uh, as I was preparing for the tour, I, I thought, gee, I should get a sponsor. And I noticed that there were uh, websites in Europe that were distributing cannabis seeds because w uh, w what I was surprised to learn is that at the time, uh, it, it was perfectly legal to be in possession of a cannabis seed. That, uh, as long as it didn't get wet and germinate, it was benign and, and you couldn't get arrested for it. You could walk into a police station with a bag of cannabis seeds. Uh, and they, they, they could only kind of look at you, uh, but not arrest you. Unless it rained, they got wet, germinated, and then it was a Class C drug, and you could get busted, uh, which was absurd to me. In any case, I wrote a letter at night to all these uh, UK distributors of cannabis seeds uh, with a, a, an example of the song and, and uh, invited them uh, to ask if anyone would be interested in being a sponsor. Well, uh, one of them wrote me right back and said, yeah, we'll give you a thousand packets of cannabis seeds <laughs> to distribute at your gigs, uh, and we'll put our website on it along with your Torah. Uh, and I was delighted. I thought, what a great idea. This is great. And I put out a press release. Within 48 hours of my putting out the press release, uh, almost every gig except for one venue up in Scotland uh, phoned or emailed or, 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 or faxed to cancel their gig. Uh, and I'd spend the next week reconstituting the tour and promising that I would not distribute uh, cannabis seeds on the premises. 
Uh, even though I argued with many of the evangelists, I said, you know, you make most of your profits by selling alcohol to your patrons, uh, who then are going to drive home drunk uh, in their cars. Uh, and, and here you are accusing me of wrongdoing by selling these seeds, which won't even flower for six months. Uh, and uh, by then, they're going to be safely ensconced in their homes. So uh, it seems hypocritical. They, they were unpersuaded. And in fact, those venues that protested the most got the most press and actually sold the most tickets for me. So it was a lesson in a carefully worded press release. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, lo and behold, years later, there are at least 18 states in the United States that uh, have legalized uh, either medical or recreational marijuana. And uh, inevitably, the, the, the whole country will legislate it because the war on drugs has proven to be uh, a, a devastating failure and a uh, wrong-headed uh, idea in the, from the, in the first place. Uh, excuse me, do you remember the venue in Scotland, which was the one exception? Uh, yes, it was uh, <laughs> the BN Inn uh, uh, in Glenfarb, which was uh, uh, programmed by uh, David Mundell, who's uh, a, a good guy and supports musicians and, uh, and respects them and their music. Fantastic stuff. Well, they always say, it's P.T. Barnum says, doesn't it? If you want to draw the crowd, start a fight. So certainly you've got lots of column inches out with that one. Fair enough. It's all good stuff. Well, TV commercials, and uh, not, not just obviously writing your music and uh, that extraordinary uh, sort of uh, stories that came there. You, you did a lot with uh, various TV and so on and so forth. Uh, Boone over here with Michael Elphick. How did that come about? I was invited to attend a charity event, uh, and uh, they asked me to auction off a, a, an opportunity to sing the du Wet Lucky Stars with me. Uh, they auctioned that off as part of this charity event. Uh, it was the children's variety. And there was a table uh, in front of me uh, of people that were from Central TV uh, that bid on the song and won a chance to sing Lucky Stars with me. And Esther Charkham, who was producing Boone at the time, uh, was very excited and, uh, and we uh, wound up singing Lucky Stars together. And just uh, a few months later, I uh, got a, a, an email from her inviting me to submit some music to the next season of the show. Uh, Jim Diamond had written the, the great opening credit song, uh, the theme song, uh, and, uh, but they wanted someone to write and score the music uh, for the show during the action, uh, all the soundtrack work, as well as songs for the end credits. And they were looking for country western music because that was sort of the theme, uh, even though he's riding his motorcycle uh, all over Nottingham and Birmingham, uh, the, 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 the ethos was that he was actually uh, a, a cowboy in a white hat on his handsome Steve riding off into the sunset to save some fair maiden. Uh, and so uh, I was really excited and, and uh, you know, I said, sure, country music is my specialty. <laughs> and truth is, uh, I, you know, I've always been eclectic and spent plenty of years going to the Philadelphia Folk Festival and listened to all kind of folk and country. So I put on my cowboy hat and uh, went in the studio and re recorded a bunch of songs and soundtrack music for the show. And I wound up doing uh, that uh, for uh, Central TV for Boone for about five seasons. In fact, if you were listening to the show during those years, you might be recognizing this familiar lick. <laughs> that was the tagline for every scene change. Uh, and uh, it was great fun uh, and, and uh, an exciting opportunity. And indeed, uh, not too long after that, the same cast and crew uh, invited me uh, to the editor, Michael Miller, uh, invited me to contribute a soundtrack for a low-budget horror film that they all collaborated on called I Bought, I the bought a Motorcycle. Motorcycle, exactly. Oh, I, I knew the link there, you see, it's got to be good. And it's better than that, isn't it? Because there's a wonderful track in there. What's the name of the track? Uh, she Runs on Blood, Not Gasoline. Come on. Uh, and it's I have to admit, when, when I first read the script, when Michael first sent me the script, I read the script and I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> How are they possibly going to make a movie about this and shoot it? And in fact, to their credit, they did. 
and I was proud to contribute all the horror music for the film. Uh, it was a great uh, composing and orchestration experience, and uh, um, one day there will be, uh, I, I bought another vampire motorcycle <laughs> sequence, uh, se sequel. And I look forward to being part of that as well. But if any of your viewers uh, are curious, I'm sure you can catch it somewhere uh, on late night cable or uh, on, uh, who knows, Netflix or Amazon. It, it's worth viewing. I just want to warn you that there is uh, there are a couple of scenes that have become cinema classics uh, in uh, horror film lore. Uh, so be aware. <laughs> we love we love those sort of cult movies and things like that. But you also get is that very sort of tongue in cheek where you get the humor coupled with the horror is the perfect juxtaposition, isn't it? Well, it was a good pairing because I think I shared those sensibilities. Because uh, you know, if you're going to have a, a motorcycle possessed <laughs> and going around slashing people in half uh, and uh, chopping their hands off. Uh, and uh, whatever, uh, then it does help to have some kind of <laughs> sense of humor about the gore. Uh, yeah. And uh, it all worked out. It's a, it's a fun viewing. So I, I highly recommend it. Just be in the right state of mind. <laughs> it's all had a good warning there as well. Now, apart from obviously writing uh, for albums and doing TV music, you also write books like Introduction to Synthesizers. How did that come about? Well, uh, after I was uh, kicked off uh, Epic, after McDonald's Gore was banned, I was left to my own de devices for a while, uh, but still very much into uh, improving my uh, skills set and, and music and recording. And, and uh, I uh, became aware of uh, a, a new synthesizer, an instrument called the Synclavier, a Synclavier. Uh, and uh, I was really eager to learn more about it, but I couldn't ex afford one because they cost like $50,000 at the time. But uh, a fellow songwriter, David Nickturn, who, who uh, great songwriter, he wrote the, uh, the beautiful Midnight on the Oasis that Maria Muldaur made a hit of. Uh, he also was uh, the uh, North America distributor for the Synclavier, and I, I found my way in his offices one day uh, and I made a, a arrangements with him to, to, to rent an hour a week on the instrument to learn it, to become uh, familiar with it, uh, which I did over time. And uh, at, at some point, just fortuitously, a phone call came through uh, from a book publishing company looking for someone to write on synthesizers. And I was there and the receptionist said, well, Dean seems to know a lot about synthesizers and put me on the phone. And I, I, with no real background other than the Synclavier, yeah. I talked my way into a book deal. And I wrote what became the first consumer guide for synthesizers, uh, as well as a book called Synthesizer Basics, published by Amsco at the time, uh, which became a staple at music schools, conservatories, and universities around the world. Uh, and uh, I also did a, uh, a series, a music series, a uh, video series, three-part intro to synthesis based on the book, uh, which was published uh, by Warner Brothers uh, and uh, all over Europe, uh, as well as here in the United States. And that was in the mid-80s, 1980s. And uh, 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 an analogous to the three decades I waited for McDonald's Girl to finally hit, uh, 30 plus years after uh, I published that video series, uh, some uh, musician in, in uh, Sweden posted it online and it went viral, it became a viral hit. And uh, synthesists and hip hop artists and producers and rap artists and electronica and uh, EDM, electronic dance music, uh, practitioners of uh, synthesis, music synthesis, uh, uh, started viewing this, and it became the go-to instructional video for synthesizers, uh, all on its own. Uh, and uh, a, a part of the reason is because, uh, although the technology of music synthesis has changed, microprocessors got smaller and more powerful, and algorithms were written, the basic physics of sound did not change one iota. So everything that I talked about in, in that 1986 video series uh, is relevant today. 
And so today, uh, 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 people all over the world watch it, and I get thank you emails uh, several times a week from people uh, as far afield as, you know, Moscow, Tokyo, uh, Sydney, uh, Hawaii, uh, London, L.A., and New York, uh, thanking me for explaining uh, a complicated subject in, uh, you know, in my typical way, which is sort of like... Uh, uh, with a, a little bit of uh, uh, humor to it. Uh, because it was all new to me, I, I, I think I was able to uh, express complicated ideas in layman's terms. And, and what's curious to me is that these days, uh, I, I, at least once a week, I get uh, an email uh, from someone ordering one of the New York School of Synthesis videos <laughs> I saw, I saw the, the t-shirts right, right behind me uh, that I, I drew the cartoon of uh, and I'm wearing in those video series. And so I ship them all over the world. It's really, it always tickles me every time I put one in the mail. And uh, again, it was an instructional video series that, that insisted on being heard, uh, just spontaneously got out there into the world. And uh, so I'm proud of it. And incredible. And the other thing that you got involved with as well was this virtual reality. Talk to me how that came about. Well, uh, during that period of time where I became immersed in uh, music technology and synthesizers, I attended a lot of trade shows uh, and uh, became familiar with uh, an Amiga computer, which was a brand new multitasking computer with custom graphics chips. It did a lot of amazing things out of the box. Uh, and uh, at one of the trade shows there, I, I saw a technology that was demonstrated uh, which uh, put people inside using a video camera. They put people in a video game and allowed them to interact with objects on the screen, just like Microsoft uh, Connect uh, does uh, today. Uh, but this was two decades before uh, the Connect and the Xbox ever came out. And uh, it was a, a really mind-blowing technology. And they were selling a developer kit, and I bought one. And I designed what became the very first virtual reality video game for national TV here in the States on Nickelodeon television, a silly game called Eat a Bug, where kids jumped up and down grabbing bugs and avoiding the spider and the bee. Uh, and uh, it became uh, a hit on a show called Total Panic, and then uh, subsequently a show called Nick Arcade, uh, where for two seasons I programmed a dozen games uh, for that as well. And this led to me uh, launching a, an independent virtual reality video game company called InVideo. Uh, and I started designing these video games, these virtual reality environments for leading, for television and leading children's museums and science museums and theme parks all over the world. So during a period of the, the late 80s uh, and early 90s, uh, after I had been sort of exiled from the music business, I uh, was doing state-of-the-art virtual reality video game design and installations all over the world. It was really exciting. It was about two decades ahead of its time, uh, which made it a challenge, but uh, it uh, kept food on our table and a roof over our heads. But uh, there was always some musical component to it. I never stopped uh, writing songs or, or making music. And uh, eventually, uh, towards the end of the 90s, I finally did get back in the studio. Uh, and started recording again. And uh, I, I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. I know, and that, that's what I love about it as well, Dean, as you say, but it's that sort of multitasking, if you like, within the industry. And you were, you were a pioneer. When people talk about virtual reality, they assume it's a new thing. But there you were, in 1986, the president and creative director of a company focused exactly on that. Well, you know what? It was not by any particular design. Uh, to me, all these new technologies and different software programs uh, were sort of just new toys to play with. You know, something that's always uh, struck me about the, the idea of being a musician is that most people go to the work, they ply their trade, or uh, they practice law or, uh, or medicine. Uh, when a musician goes to work, he goes to play. And uh, that aspect of play is, is something that uh, uh, is always important for me to keep in mind. Uh, you know, no matter how you know, technologically challenging uh, a particular project is, is that element of play, which is, I think, crucial to uh, that uh, creative spark. 
and uh, something I always try to retain. And so when I was working in virtual reality or animation uh, or designing strange musical instruments for children's museums, uh, it was that element of play that I always tried to retain in terms of my perspective and, and thoughts and how I implement those ideas as well. Yeah. When you talk about strange musical instruments, give me an example. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, in the early 90s, I sold one of my virtual reality video games to the Eureka Children's Museum in Halifax, England. Uh, and while visiting there, uh, they, they indicated a, a big space which they uh, had allocated for a music exhibit, but they hadn't confirmed what that would be. And uh, I gave it a lot of thought. And I, I have been to children's museums in the past where they had what I thought were really boring music exhibits. And I thought, wow, you know, with all the technology, you could make something really fun and exciting and appealing to kids. And uh, so I, I, I went back and I had scribbled a whole bunch of strange, unusual instruments that I thought would be innately uh, appealing and inviting to kids to be able to play and interact with the instruments and to design them in a way that you couldn't uh, make horrible sounds, that you could make fun, playful sounds, no matter what you did, no matter what your learning level was, and uh, that it would be engaging and interactive. And so I created a whole slew of instruments like the booble, which is a three-foot globe covered in 150 bicycle horns. When you squeeze them, they would make all kinds of sounds. In fact, right over my shoulder there are four booble bowls. Oh, there you go. Absolutely. From the actual I booble. I those in the back. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, and there was also a honk plat, which was three spring-loaded nine-foot uh, fiberglass horns uh, attached to three spring-loaded pneumatic stools that when you sat on the stool, it would force air through a foghorn, make a really loud black. Uh, and uh, I designed a laser harp and, and tone stones and a honk plat and jingling lilies. It was all fun, uh, inviting, whimsical instruments uh, to, uh, to have children, give children an opportunity to interact and engage with musical instruments and sound uh, in a way that was not threatening to them. Because, you know, if, if you give someone with no instruction a guitar, uh, it's going to be difficult for them to have uh, any enjoyment right off the bat, uh, unless you're patient and, uh, with them. But in a museum exhibit context, uh, these instruments did the job. They uh, entertain kids uh, and uh, became a big hit. And uh, not too long after the Eureka Children's Museum opened, uh, I was getting uh, uh, commissions to create music instruments, the music atrium instruments for children's museums and theme parks all over the world. For, for a period of time, I was doing these virtual reality video games and these strange musical instruments. And uh, it, as I say, it kept me really busy, but there was always, as I say, some musical component to it. Uh, and then once the internet came along and, and uh, I was able to reconnect with my original audience, uh, I, I finally had an opportunity to uh, go in the studio and uh, make music again and record songs, and uh, I haven't stopped. Yeah, well, which is glorious. And the other thing which you've invented, but before we move on from that, though, I'm talking about horns, what's the story of the rhino on your wall? Oh, well, that was on some uh, African safari, and I took out my blunderbuss, and uh, <laughs> there was cotton uh, stuffing everywhere. Uh, it's just, it's a stuffed rhino. Uh, and no actual rhinos were harmed uh, in this production, uh, but it always tickles me to see him on the wall. He's got a, uh, a, a cousin giraffe uh, up our staircase uh, leading to the living room. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's his, uh, he's got pride of place there on the back wall. Yeah, it's all interesting. So, pioneers, and this is what I really wanted to, to eke out that sort of story, so to understand the real Dean Friedman is to understand all of those. You were a pioneer in virtual reality. You write these tremendous books, which are still iconic to this day. The other thing which you really embraced was the idea of what they now call crowdfunding. Talk to me about how that came about. Well, uh, it was, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, around 2001, I was sitting in my tree house 
and uh, I'd written a bunch of songs. I, I was eager to go back in the studio and record, but uh, you know, I didn't have the financing at that time to upgrade my studio or pay musicians, uh, but I had just started accumulating an, an email list uh, with the advent of having a website up there. And uh, I wrote an email to all the folks on my email list saying, look, I've got all these songs, I'm ready to do a new album. Uh, I don't want to wait another 20 years for some idiot record executive to give me permission to do it, but if you pre-order the album, I'll go in the studio and record and, and, uh, uh, and I'll ship that CD out as soon as it's ready. And I was a little concerned that everyone would say, oh, Dean, why don't you get a proper job? And some people actually said just that in their emails. We why don't you work like everybody else? Uh, but enough people were supportive of the idea that I was able to uh, finance uh, upgrading my gear and paying musicians. Uh, and that was 2001, that was the Treehouse Journals. And uh, as, far as, I was aware, as far as I'm aware, that was the first online crowdfunding effort by a, uh, an independent solo musician. The band Marillion had done it uh, uh, that same year earlier. Uh, and they're you know, documented as the first uh, uh, group of musicians to crowdfund. Did, uh, did, you, did you know they were doing that at that time or did you both come up with the idea at the same time? I was vaguely aware of it uh, as a concept, um, and uh, but it just seemed the natural thing to do. Uh, I had I was communicating with an audience, and uh, it was a, a uniquely two-way communication uh, as opposed to pr the previous uh, music business model, which is that you're supposed to be aloof and ignore your fans uh, and uh, only wave at them uh, from the limo as you're leaving the gig. Uh, but the internet made it possible to have a conversation, and it was a two-way conversation, and uh, that's something I, I always valued. And for any independent musician, I uh, uh, I r recommend it as a a model for pursuing music uh, because it, it's, it's really a great way of doing it. And you did that also with squirrels in the attic, and that worked well for you as well, didn't it? Uh, I've been crowdfunding my albums ever since, including the latest, uh, American Lullaby. Uh, and uh, my uh, fan base ha have been patient and supportive. Uh, it took almost years, two years to, to finally get it done. But uh, over the last eight months, I was able to record. Uh, and uh, it's finally coming out the end of August. August 27th is the official release date. And it's something I'm real proud of and uh, eager for folks to get a chance to hear. Oh, it's fantastic. And talk to me, because a lot of the inspiration, American Lullaby, a lot of the inspiration is about this madness that we've all suffered, if you like, for the last several months. And every one of those tracks is inspired to some degree by that madness, isn't it? It's true. In some ways, this is a chronicle, my, my personal take on, on all the madness that we've endured. Uh, uh, for the last, really, six years, ever since uh, a, a deranged, uh, failed reality TV uh, host and, and huckster uh, became president of the United States and uh, really shook everyone's sense of reality and, and security because we knew, particularly folks in New York uh, who were familiar with his uh, behavior and actions, we knew that it spelled disaster and that people were gonna die and, and that's proven to be the case. Uh, so that sense of, of reality of something have, having gone terribly wrong in the normal course of events uh, is something that uh, was very palpable and I think not just here in America but around the world. And so I, I, I tried to really chronicle all those feelings, all the things that have been going on. And it, it really deals with all these difficult topics. Uh, you know, the, the devastating pandemic and the, the, what we used to call the pending uh, uh, climate disaster. Now it's no longer pending or looming, and now it's here. And, uh, you know, the, the perpetual issues of racism and, and sexism and uh, all exacerbated by our inane uh, political situation and polarization. I, I, I felt compelled to write about it, really in part to try and help myself understand it, to try and wrap my head around all these strange things that were going on 
that just seemed uh, rule breaking every day uh, and uh, changing norms uh, for uh, inexplicable reasons. So uh, sometimes just to try and process for myself what's going on, I'll write a song to, to help me understand it and hopefully if people can get uh, some of their own uh, understanding by uh, listening to the song, well, that's e even better. Uh, but to do so, I, I, I really needed to go back, I think, to what I viewed as the root of all this, the genesis of it. We didn't get here overnight. Uh, and uh, so I, I wrote the title track, American Lullaby, uh, to try and deal with uh, America's original sins of uh, massacre of the indigenous population uh, and slavery. Uh, tied in with our uh, just inexplicable love affair with guns. And uh, so I tried to do that in, in a format that, that would not terrify people and just send them scattering. Uh, and so I envisioned it as a lullaby, and that's the title of the new album, American Lullaby, as well as the title track, uh, which, uh, if you think about it, all lullabies share some strange thing in common, which is that they tell of terrible uh, things happening to innocent children, uh, but they do it in a soothing and calming tone so as not to terrify them uh, at the same time. Uh, even something as seemingly innocent as rock a -bye baby on the treetop, when the wind blows, the cradle will rock. Well, eventually the wind blows, the bow breaks, the cradle falls on the kid's head, uh, and this is supposed to put a kid to sleep. Uh, it, it, it struck me as a curious form, but I realized that if it makes sense for uh, trying to uh, to pass on important messages and warnings to the next generation, uh, but so as not to terrify them, to do it in the form of a lullaby, and that's my intent for this whole album. No, no, and, and it works superbly well on that sort of juxtaposition of, of the comedic with the tragedy and, and making people focus on it. The nursery rhymes themselves are always very dark. I mean, three blind mice see how they run chop off their tails. I mean, it's about mutilating handicapped animals, isn't it? Ring a ring of roses is all about the plague and people sneezing. I mean, all of that sort of stuff throughout history is done in a wonderful way that people repeat it, but there's a dark message there as well, isn't there? Absolutely. And, you know, before the internet and before print, uh, songs and poems and stories were how all these events were communicated and dispersed throughout the populations. And it helped if it, if it had, you know, a, a lovely melody and a catchy rhyme. And I guess it's a tradition that I uh, uh, continue to honor to this day. Well, and, and brilliantly so. And there's a number of traditions. I mean, talk about fables and making up stories and so on and so forth. One of the ones I, I particularly liked is half man, half biscuit. And the bastard son, the bastard son of Dean Freeman. How did you first hear about this? I got a phone call from a good friend in London, Andy, and he said, Dean, something's going on here you need to be aware of. I said, what's up? And he said, well, there's a band outside of Liverpool called Half Man, Half Biscuit. And I said, that's a funny name for a song. He said, that's not the funny part, Dean. I said, okay, what's the funny part? And he said, well, they just released a best-selling LP, and the title track is, I bo uh, the title track is, the bastard son of Dean Friedman. And uh, I figured he was kidding because that just didn't seem very likely until I landed at Heathrow Airport to start a new tour. And uh, Andy met me there with the EP and sure enough, there's the title track, The Bastard Son of Dean Friedman. At which case I confess to getting a little nervous because after all, I'm Dean Friedman. Uh, but I finally sat down, I did the math, I calculated in order for me to have fathered this guy, Nigel Blackwell, I would have had to have done so when I was seven. Uh, so greatly relieved, I finally sat down and listened to it, and great track. Uh, and uh, Ni Nigel Blackwell, terrific songwriter, Half Man, Half Biscuit, kicking band. In fact, I urge your listeners, if you've never heard that song, uh, go to YouTube, type in The Bastard Son, <laughs> Dean Friedman. Uh, and, and you'll be able to hear it. It's, uh, it's brilliant. Oh, it's hilarious. And, and what I love is that Nigel's got a great sense of humor, but he was a genuine, uh, well, still is, a, a genuine Dean Friedman fan. Well, well, said the rocking chair. He had a rare vinyl copy, didn't he? Uh, I did wind up meeting Nigel in the band, and he did confess to having it 
uh, growing up in this house. So, uh, um, and let me tell you, they're really good guys. Uh, in fact, I, I wrote a repost, repost to the song called A Baker's, a Baker's Tale. Tale. I love A Baker's Tale. It's hilarious. It tells the, uh, the hitherto untold uh, tales of the dubious origins of one Nigel Blackwell. So I got a chance to exact my revenge. And, and they were uh, gracious enough to invite me on stage to sing at one of their gigs in Wolverhampton. And I was a little nervous, but after, by the second chorus, everyone was singing along. And at the end of the show, I joined Nigel and the band on stage for a rousing rendition of The Bastard Son of Dean Friedman. <laughs> I love that. Do you think I could persuade you to do a Baker's Tale? I will give it a, my best shot. Hold on a second. <laughs> I love it. There you go. I thought a guitar might be to hand. So this was glorious. And we come on to Edinburgh and that wonderful sort of comedy side that, that works on, the, on that sort of basis as well. Um, because part of your tour is going to be a virtual tour of Edinburgh. And again, the dates are on the website, which is a real rip-roaring opportunity to uh, see being live. And as it is what I absolutely love. So this was your answer to uh, uh, the bastard son of Dean Freeman. And this is uh, a baker's tale. Once there was a humble baker Spent all day making buns and cakes and Rolls and loaves of bread and muffins He loved his work but it wasn't enough He longed to offer up his heart To not just any tar One of substance and of virtue But suitable candidates were oh so few Oh Nigel Buck Blackwell, pray please do tell How could your parents risk it? Baker's son born of a bun Half a man, half a biscuit He gently took her from the oven Her sweet scent set off waves of loving his eyes beheld her flaky crust He thought I mustn't But I must Alas, Nigel's dad could not resist her He held her close and then he kissed her Before another word was uttered His mama's buns were buttered Oh, Nigel Blackwell, pray please do tell could your parents risk it? Baker's son, born of a bun, half a man, half a biscuit. And so please mark this poignant tale. Next time you see baked goods for sale, which proves true love defies convention and leads to couplings we can't mention. So it comes as no surprise The needy baker's dough did rise Though some may scoff to ride and scorn From such forbidden love Nigel was born Oh, Nigel Blackwell, pray please do tell How could your parents risk it? Baker's son born of a bun Half a man, half a man Half a man, half a biscuit Hey, I love it. This has got to be good. You're working, you're working on that sort of premise. So, Nigel, I think it's fair to say, um, is not your son, bastard or otherwise. But you do have two fabulous children, Hannah and Sam. What do they make of this whole music malarkey? <laughs> well, they're both talented uh, musicians and songwriters in their own right and do all kinds of various multimedia pursuits. And uh, it used to be fun when they were little. I would, as soon as they were old enough to carry their own uh, luggage, I, I would bring them out on the road uh, to take them on tour. They'd be part of the band. Uh, but now they're both very successful doing what they do, and I, I don't think I can afford to tour them anymore. <laughs> and but Alison sort of famously uh, asked you, if you gain an inspiration for another song. What do you do, Dean? 
Uh, well, uh, that's true. Uh, I think you're referring to uh, it's my job. Uh, the idea that uh, when you're a musician, uh, sometimes it's hard for other people to wrap their head around what it actually is you spend your day doing. And uh, so um, it's, it's hard to answer that question at cocktail parties and, and whatnot. And uh, it's especially awkward when your own wife asks you. Uh, so, uh, for that reason, I, I did try to come up with a song to, to, to answer that very question. Um, and I suspect you're going to ask me to play it now. Is that Not the case? Not only have you won, but it's got that wonderful line in it that my main job is loving you, which I just love as a line. Well, again, I'll give it a shot, so bear with me a second. Everybody wonders just what is it that I do. They scratch their heads and speculate, but they don't have a clue. No, I may seem unemployed, that's not exactly true. I do some part-time work, but honey, my main job is loving you. It's my job to make you happy. It's my job to make you smile. It's my job to take you in my arms and hold you for a while. It's my job to make you feel good, and I'm never going to stop. Well, it's my job to love you, honey, and I love my job. Well, I, I went to my accountant to do my taxes like you do. When he asked my occupation, I filled in loving you. Well, I'm suited to my vocation just like good old Captain Kirk. And I never will retire because I'm addicted to my work. It's my job to make you happy. It's my job to make you smile. It's my job to take you in my arms and hold you for a while. It's my job to protect you from the littlest raindrop. Well, it's my job to love you, honey, and I love my job. Well, I never finished high school, but I found a fine career. The money's not that good, but honey, that's not why I'm here. Because where else could I spend all my time whispering sweet nothings in your ear? And if I never get paid a penny, honey, I'll still volunteer. It's my job to make you happy. It's my job to make you smile. It's my job to take you in my arms and hold you for a while. It's my job to care about you, cause you make my heart throb. But it's my job to love you, honey, and I love my job. Well, the terms of my employment are quite favorable, it's true. With benefits and bonuses like spending time with you. And I never have to worry about things like job security. As long as I keep loving you, you'll keep loving me. It's my job to make you happy. It's my job to make you smile. It's my job to take you in my arms and hold you for a while. It's my job to make you feel good and I'm never going to stop. Well, it's my job to love you, honey, and I love my job. Yes, it's my job to love you, honey, and I love my job. Yes, it's my job to love you, honey, and I love my job. Hey, come on. And it's got to be true, hasn't it, Dean? You say, I never will retire because I'm addicted to my work with a rhyme coupled with Captain Kirk as well. That's true about you, isn't it? You are addicted to your work. <laughs> and my wife. <laughs> and your wife, of course. <laughs> yeah, glorious stuff. So tell me, a really rich career, fantastic stuff. What has been your biggest regret? 
Uh, my biggest regret. Um, gee, you know, uh, I guess uh, it. Uh, I, I'd say it's it's the fact that after McDonald Girl was banned by the BBC and I was dropped by my label, I no longer uh, was part of the the mainstream music industry. And, and I, I am grateful and I cherish the little niche that I've carved out uh, online for myself and uh, my very enthusiastic, lovely supporters who've made it possible for me to, to, to pursue my music. Uh, and I am ever grateful to them for doing so. Uh, but, uh, I, I, you know, songs are like little kids. You love them all. Uh, and, you know, some are better behaved than others. But uh, you, want them all to, you want them to go out in the world and, and do good and succeed. And I guess my biggest regret is that I haven't had occasion to share the music uh, with more people. And uh, that's still an aspiration. And I, I have a feeling that, that uh, regardless of whatever I do, that the songs themselves will, will persist and uh, get heard one way or the other. And I, I think that's certainly right. And what advice then would you give the nine-year-old Dean Friedman, who's sitting there at your nanny's music guitar, uh, about the profession? What advice would you give that young chap? Well, uh, I would say, uh, learn to read a record contract. <laughs> that's what I would say. I would say, uh, you know, uh, find someone in your corner to represent you. Uh, properly and fairly and justly. That's not always an easy task. And uh, um, ultimately, you have to take responsibility for the choices you make in the career with whatever information you have. So be informed. Be, be informed, be prepared, absolutely. Question everything as we keep advising people. The rich, rich careers, some fantastic highlights. I'm so pleased you've had an opportunity to shine a spotlight on some of the uh, lesser known facts about Dean Friedman. What has been your proudest moment? Uh, well, you know what? My proudest moment is uh, being on stage with my kids and, and turning to my right and left and, and seeing them perform and, and uh, smiles on their faces and, uh, and in, in engaging in the music. Uh, and uh, the, the people, uh, the uh, young adults that they have become. Uh, and, uh, you know, career-wise, who knows? It's uh, it's getting feedback from listeners who uh, are uh, expressing how the songs that I put out in the world have helped them survive difficult times, uh, and uh, you know that's something that's always uh, a, a delight and, and gratifying to hear because you know you write a song. Uh, very often in isolation, it goes out into the world and you really never know what kind of impact that it has. But uh, if it gives people joy and pleasure and solace, uh, then it does its, it's done its job and, and uh, I, I've done mine. And, and certainly, I mean, these are the stories I would urge everybody to dig into your rich catalog because there are stories there for everybody. It's recounting, it's a short story set to music is the best way of describing it. But Dean, and I, I ask all of my guests this, is uh, how would you, Dean Friedman, uh, like to be remembered? You know, as uh, uh, some guy who wrote a, a bunch of songs that uh, made people happy and uh, built a lot of weird, strange instruments that delighted kids and created some strange virtual reality game environments that and engaged people all over the world and uh, uh, did these uh, video series that uh, informed and illuminated a, a complicated topic for uh, synthesists and whatnot. I guess to someone who uh, was ever curious and pursued that curiosity uh, in uh, his creative efforts and tried to share it with the, anyone uh, interested in uh, listening? A, a beautiful thing. If you want details about um, the virtual concert you're doing the Edinburgh Fringe, 
Uh, that's all on your website, as indeed are details about the album. To finish with then, Dean, uh, I think we should have something from American Lullaby. Um, what would you like to play for us? Uh, well, I'd be very pleased to, 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 to finish off with the title track of American Lullaby. Uh, and uh, I'll move over to the piano in a moment, just, but just to preface it by explaining, uh, as I said earlier, that uh, it, the whole album talks about our current state of affairs, uh, all these bewildering events that are taking place. But I felt in, in order to, to do that properly, I needed to go back to the origins of the mess we are in now, because we didn't get here overnight. And uh, so American Lullaby does that. It, it, it goes back 400 years, it touches on our original sins, uh, the massacre of the indigenous population, uh, as well as slavery, and our long-held inexplicable addition, addiction to, to guns. And just to, touch on a few references in the lyrics so that it, it doesn't confuse the listener. Half Moon is the name of a ship, a sailing ship, uh, that a, a, a Dutch captain, Henry Hudson, uh, sailed uh, hoping to find a Northwest Passage to India, but instead sailed up what we now call the Hudson River. Uh, and uh, the uh, reference also to uh, the drinking gourd is a reference to slavery days when escaped slaves uh, were taught nursery rhymes and songs to follow the, the drinking gourd, which was their reference to the Big Dipper constellation in the sky, which would help leave, lead them north to the freer states. And uh, Peg Leg Joe is uh, reference to a semi-mythological character also in those slavery days who uh, is described as someone helping the es escaping slaves, uh, aiding them in their journey north. And finally, a reference I make to paradise. Uh, uh, paradise, uh, in addition to being paradise, is also the name of a, a, a city that's part of Las Vegas. Uh, and uh, a site of, of the worst, the single worst mass shooting uh, in American history uh, during a country music festival in Las Vegas just a few years back. And with that said, uh, I'll go to the keyboard and perform uh, American Lullaby. Fantastic. Uh, and all those who are interested, all the details about the four dates, the Edinburgh Fringe uh, Festival dates, they're all available on Dean's website. Do come along for that and find out about this fantastic album. It has been such a delight uh, to play us out with over to Dean Friedman and American Lullaby. Don't you fret now, don't you cry. It's an American lullaby. Manifest destiny's a lie. It's an American lullaby. Half moon sailing through the night. Crack of a musket fire, first light. Always keep your powder dry. dreams you'll fly It's an American lullaby Blaze a trail across the sky
It's an American lullaby Unclench your fist and dry your eye It's an American lullaby Friedman, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much uh, for being my very special guest. Thanks for having me, Andrew. So thank you again to the wonderful Dean Friedman. Uh, do check out his website for details of that virtual concert at the Edinburgh Fringe. And do pre-order a copy of American Lullaby. And look at some of the older stuff that we spoke about as well. Uh, it's been a real joy. Thank you so much for being my guests. If you have any thoughts or comments, you can write to me at guests at octopustv.com. That's guests at octopustv.com. And uh, don't forget, you can follow me at Andrew Eborn at Octopus TV and subscribe to The Andrew Eborn Show on all of the usual platforms. More platforms than Paddington. Uh, but for me for now, thank you for joining me and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>